told that she is paying it forward to invest in the lives of our young people, some of whom you will see singing uh, right up here in just a few moments uh, at the time of the offertory. Uh, our, our youngest children's choir will be singing today, and that's part of Taylor's ministry is, uh, is supporting that group. Also get to meet or be reintroduced today to Eric Balmer, who is our new pastoral intern. Eric is a senior at Georgetown College, uh, has been a watch care member of our church for a little over a year now, but has been uh, worshiping with us and serving in various ways since his freshman year. Uh, and if the, if the name Balmer sounds familiar, although Eric is very much his own person, you know his brother Jonathan, who is also a member of our church. And if that doesn't ring a bell, he's the person on the prayer list who is a Fulbright teaching English in Korea. The Balmer family has been uh, just a very special part of our, of our church for these last, oh goodness, five or six years now. And we get to worship with their folks from time to time too from a sister church up in the Cincinnati area. Well, we continue this morning a, a sermon series from the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And today we arrive at Luke chapter 9, verse 51, which is uh, the, the indisputed uh, turning point, the watershed moment in, in the gospel of Luke. Uh, everything hinges on what happens at this moment. In fact, uh, there, there are gaps even in some of the more ancient manuscripts. There's probably a gap in your Bible between verse 50 and verse 51. The story is broken here uh, to, to mark this transition. If you were here Wednesday night for our Ash Wednesday service, we read that passage of Scripture from about verse 22 up to about verse 50. As Luke, the storyteller, is getting us ready for this transition. Uh, two times, just prior to verse 51, Jesus begins to predict uh, to his disciples that he's, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be betrayed and handed over, he's going to suffer uh, unjustly at the hands of his betrayers, he's going to be executed. And after three days, he will rise again. There's even a moment, just a few verses before this one, where Jesus takes the innermost circle of disciples, goes up on a mountainside with them, and everything physically, everything about his appearance changes. Uh, there is a, a cloud that comes and, and hovers over them, much like the presence of the Lord uh, on the holy mountain in, in, in the book of Exodus. Uh, as, as Moses is hidden from the people below when he's receiving the word of the Lord in the Ten Commandments. There are characters from the Old Testament who appear there. Jesus uh, begins to take on a different look, a different appearance. Uh, I like to say that the word transfiguration is a made-up word because it, it just isn't big or grand enough to say that he was transformed in his appearance. He was transfigured in his appearance. All of that leads up to verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. There's so much about this passage that is rich in its theology and, and in its meaning, but, but at a very basic level. Something is happening in this passage that is familiar, I think, to all of us. And that is, herein lies a difficult, challenging transition. It's a transition in the life of Jesus and in the story of the Jesus movement. One that people in the Jesus movement will struggle to understand. It's one that they'll struggle to make peace with. They will deal with it emotionally. They will deal with it relationally. It is a transition that, in many ways, it is impossible for, for them to see coming, even though Jesus tries to explain it to them a couple of times, and will once again later on in chapter 18. Part of what I see in 
verse 54, as James and John, who had been on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus and had glimpsed, had witnessed that something special was happening, as they wonder if they should bring down thunder and lightning. Incidentally, these are also some of the disciples who will be very concerned about which ones will be the greatest when Jesus comes into his kingdom. I wonder if there's not some ulterior motive here. You know, if we, if we could talk Jesus into letting us bring down thunder and lightning and consume these people, you know, maybe we would get to be the most powerful. Maybe there's some of that. But part of their motivation and part of what Jesus says they may not do is the reminder to me that when I face difficult transition in life, lashing out at others simply does not help. Kicking the dog, slamming the car door, blaming my boss or my employer, whoever it may be, lashing out at others does not help. And so Jesus says, no, he rebukes them. Guys, you're, you're still not getting it. I'm reminded, of course, that Christians are not always out in front. We don't always take the lead and set the best example about working through difficult transition, right? There's been a lot written this week about how Pope Francis was able to sit down with uh, his counterpart in the, in the Russian Orthodox Church, and they were able to be peaceful with one another and, and, and talk about reconciliation, and, and much has been said about how great that is until you do the math, right? This conversation was only 1,000 years in the making. Christians have not always let out when it comes to working through difficult transition. And more recently, in the last, oh goodness, not even 24 hours, as the news of the untimely death of Justice Scalia has spread across our country, most of the people who I have seen or heard react to that news have been people of faith. Most of them have been my sisters and brothers in Christ. And I don't know that I've heard a single person, even my Christian sisters and brothers, say, here is a man who has died, a child of God, a person with a family, a person with real relationships, a person who tried ideologically to do what he thought was best, what I have heard, even in the very same breath that a person has said, did you hear that Justin Scalia has died, comma, and this means Obama will or should not or there will be an appointment of a successor. Christians, too, struggle with transition. We struggle with the difficult relational aspects of those moments in life when things change. The storyteller writes in verse 52, Jesus sent messengers ahead of him. I, I might imagine these folks as, as people that Jesus sends out so that in the days before the internet and before phone calls and, and, and before you could just make contact with a motel along the side of the U.S. highway, that he would be assured of a place to stay now that he's moving toward Jerusalem. We need to understand that from this moment forward, every step that Jesus takes, every village that he enters, in his mind, He's walking to the cross. He's moving toward Jerusalem at every step. These folks are, are easing the way. If John the Baptist came to be the one to make straight the way of the Lord, these folks are, are helping to, to lay the foundation of the road so that Jesus can get where he's going. And that's very different than how Jesus has lived in his public ministry and presumably in his life up to this point. Everything up to this point, Jesus has always sort of taken life as it comes. 
He may be on his way to heal one person, but if, a, if another person approaches him in a crowd and he senses the power to go out from him, or someone interrupts and says, but, but someone is sick in my household, Jesus will pause, he'll stop doing whatever it is he was on his way to do and tend to the presenting problem right in front of him. Verse 52 is telling us that in many ways this approach will change. Even in those times from this point on when Jesus will pause along his journey, he is still thinking of the cross. Every step, every village, every highway is leading to the cross of Christ. Verse 53 has always been puzzling to me in a a couple of different ways. They did not receive him, these Samaritans in this Samaritan village, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. I've always been puzzled. Why was it that the Samaritans refused to receive him? And, 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 and why was it that um, it mattered that Jesus had Jerusalem on his mind? But in reality, the, the Samaritans' reaction is very understandable. Of course, They did not want to welcome the rabbi to stay with them. You've been in that situation where you're on a telephone call and on the other end of the line you can hear someone having another conversation or you can hear someone typing on a computer or you can tell that you've lost that person's attention. This is the reaction when you're face-to-face with someone and they repeatedly pull out a cell phone to answer text messages or send emails. This This is what happens when we can tell that Someone's mind is someplace else. We no longer want to visit with that person. But just imagine why it is that Jesus is distracted. Just remember what it is that Jesus has on his mind, where it is that he is going, and what his purpose is in going to the cross in Jerusalem. I need to be reminded to be patient with others. Too often when I have heard someone typing on the other end of the phone or have sensed that I've lost their attention, I I too have wanted to write them off. But the Samaritans here remind me that the other person's distraction, it may be a burden of which I know little or nothing. My phone call or our appointment may have interrupted their grief. It may have come on the heels of another phone call when they learned a diagnosis. It may be someone who is struggling with something physical or relational or psychological or spiritual that they're just about to share with me if I'll be patient just a little longer. It's not that Jesus suddenly doesn't have time anymore. It's not that Jesus suddenly doesn't care anymore or is suddenly somehow prejudiced or bigoted towards Samaritans. It's that for all of the Gospel of Luke, right up to 9, chapter 9, verse 50, Jesus has shown us already how to live in the same way that he has lived. A life of sacrifice. A life willing to have suffering, to take on the yoke of Jesus upon us, to live graciously, to live lives where we are tearing down uh, the walls and and the boundaries uh, that, that organized religion would sometimes place so rigidly. He's shown us how to live. But now, starting at verse 51, the best thing Jesus can do for the Samaritans or for the disciples or for you or for any of us is to get to the cross. Another old translation says it this way, he must needs go to Jerusalem. He absolutely with certainty has to be upon the final journey to the cross. And so, From this point on, 
every word, every story, every teaching that we read in Luke's gospel, we need to understand that the shadow of the cross looms in the distance. At least it does for Jesus and for the storyteller. The rest of the folks still don't get it. And perhaps neither do I. So there are two lessons here I'd like for us to take away from this passage this morning. The first one is a fairly practical one. First lesson I'd like us to see is this. There is a difference between what is truly important and what is merely urgent. There is a difference between what is truly important in life and what is merely urgent. On a day that we celebrate, she moved again. I was going to say hi to, to Taylor, but she moved again. She's helping the children's choir get ready. I, I got to quit just looking for, I mean, every time I try to say something to Taylor in a service, I lose her. I won't do that anymore. Y'all help me remember. Um, threw me off a second. As she said a moment ago, today is a day when we celebrate love. We celebrate love relationships. What a perfect lesson for Valentine's Day. That sometimes, and in some people, there's a difference between what is truly important and what is merely urgent. I can fill my life with what is urgent. I can fill my calendar, every gap, every margin, every moment with what is urgent. Particularly in a world that is as hyper-connected as ours is today, I can always find something in ur well actually something urgent can always find me if I will allow it but there are things there are moments there are persons there are relationships that are truly important and are so easily crowded out in my life by those things that are merely merely urgent they're truly important but I allow them to be crowded out by the urgent. A, a story from apartheid-era South Africa teaches me this lesson. There once was a an occasion in a very remote area of South Africa that a local magistrate died. A, a white man, he had been loved and respected by all kinds of folks in South Africa. In fact, because he dared to be fair to the majority uh, tribal ethnic residents of South Africa, there were thousands who wanted to attend his funeral. Uh, the tribal Africans, not the white-skinned Afrikaners, wanted to come to where he was going to be uh, remembered in a white Presbyterian church. They traveled, they walked, they journeyed, some of them hours, some of them miles to get to where the service would be held. And when the white Presbyterian pastor saw that an integrated congregation was coming together during apartheid-era South Africa, he panicked. And he canceled a funeral because of his fear. What he did, thinking that he was preserving order, merely added fuel to what was a smoldering fire. Another local pastor, a pastor Buti, a tribal African, recognized that there was a moment that was about to explode in their region, and so he wanted to be uh, ahead of the conflict. He went to see the Supreme Court Justice who was assigned to their area, another man who was beloved and respected by people of all different backgrounds, who also happened to be the acting chief justice, a man named Judge Schreiner. He began to talk to Judge Schreiner about the fact that every year in their community, in their region, there was a Maundy Thursday service when tribal African folk of all different backgrounds would come together for worship. It was a service, perhaps like you grew up with, a service of a Monday Thursday washing of the feet. Pastor Buti explained that he, as the pastor, would wash the feet 
of the oldest person in the congregation. That his daughter would then wash the feet of a child in the congregation who was crippled. And that he also wanted to have washed the feet of one other person in the congregation. The, the feet of a woman named Martha. Martha Fortuin. And with a, a lump in his throat, Pastor Bouti said to the acting chief justice of apartheid-era South Africa, Judge, I am asking you to wash her feet. There was a pause. A black pastor had just asked a white judge publicly to wash the feet of a black woman in apartheid-era South Africa. And the judge did not miss a beat. Martha, he asked, she has washed the feet of all my children. Why should I hesitate to wash her feet? You see, this Martha Fortuin had been an employee in the, in the justice's home for years. And so on Monday, Thursday, put, they put their plan into action. First, the pastor called forward, or, or rather went to the, the location of the oldest person in the church. And then his daughter did likewise, moved throughout the congregation to the, to the little girl who was crippled and washed her feet. And then the pastor called out the name of Martha Fortuin and said, I call upon Brother Schreiner to come and wash her feet. And from the back of the room, tucked away in a place where no one even knew he was there, came walking forward the acting chief justice of apartheid-era South Africa. And he knelt, and he washed the feet of a black woman. History remembers Schreiner. as not once but twice being passed over for the job of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of South Africa. Historians have given him a title, the best Chief Justice South Africa never had. And it was because he took stances like this one at a time when it would have been politically and professionally expedient for him to uphold the status quo. Pastor Bouti went to speak with him afterward, beginning to recognize what had happened in the judge's career. And he began to ask him about the sacrifice that it was perceived he had made. And Schreiner had these words to say, it, it may be so, and it may be not, but taking part in your service was to me more important than the chief justiceship of our nation. Jesus is teaching us that there is a difference between what is truly important and what is merely urgent in our lives. But I mentioned that there was a second lesson here, and I want to close by, by describing it. The second, more greater theological reason is this. Until verse 51, Jesus up till now has been showing all of us how to live through sacrifice, through tearing down injustice, through raising up righteousness, for tearing down religious obstructionism. But after verse 51, Jesus is dedicated to what he alone uniquely can do and what he decides he must do. Back in verse 22 and in verse 44, he has predicted his death. He will do so again in chapter 18. Only Jesus could do this. Only Jesus could go to the cross. Only Jesus could go into the tomb. Only Jesus could be raised three days later. But he did this unique act for all of us, for each and every one. That the slate might be wiped clean for each of us. 
that we all might have a rite of passage to the Holy One and that we might be able to join in abundant life in this world and eternal life in the next because of the forgiveness made possible through Him. That radical love act of going to the cross will captivate the remainder of Luke's gospel, verse 51 and onward. Only Jesus could do it, but he did it for each one, for everyone, for all of us. That gift is offered to you today. Jesus did what was truly important, that only he could do, and he offers that to you. If you've never accepted that forgiveness, if you've never received him as Savior and Lord of your life, if you've never been set free from your past, from yourself, from the mess of your ways, then receive him today. Our musicians are going to lead us in a time of response. And as we sing, we invite you to come forward and share the decisions that you might be making today for Jesus. If you're ready to receive him as Savior and Lord, come forward and, and, and share that with us. If you need help finding the words to be able to pray and invite Jesus into your life, come and share that and, and we can pray together and help you find those words. Or if you recognize that, that you want that type of relationship that you've heard uh, Taylor talk about this morning and you've, you've seen in this room, you recognize that these sisters and brothers truly have become your faith family and, and you're ready to, to become a member of Georgetown Baptist then won't you come and share that decision as well? Or if there are other ways that you are responding today through conviction, through thoughtfulness about transition in your life or uh, those things that are truly important that need to begin trumping those things that are merely urgent in your world. However it is that you need to respond to the work of the Holy One, we stand and we sing in hopes that you'll come.